Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Youth Matters, a show looking at local, global and national issues affecting the youth of today. Now, today's show needs no introduction. The uh, title of the show is Hashtag uh, Muslim Ban. Uh, is this just the start? And there's been so much that's been written about this, said about this, and you know, it made sense that we discussed it with our youths and found out from their perspective how this has affected them. Now I'm delighted that I have a live audience of young people joining us today for the very first time on a special show of Youth Matters. I'm also delighted that we have a panel uh, of guests who will provide different perspectives on this particular topic. Um, I'd like to start off by introducing Ibrahim Mahmoud, who is the Communications Officer of CAGE. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Okay. You uh, uh, we also have uh, Arib Ullah, who's a journalist for Middle East Eye. Thank you, Arib, for coming on the Thanks show. For me and finally, we have Elaine Bagshaw, okay, uh, who's a Liberal Democrat uh, spokesperson for Poplar and Limehouse. Thank, Thank you for, for coming on the show. That's absolutely fine. And. Uh, also, our live audience of students from universities, colleges and schools. And uh, we look forward to listening to your views today as well. So thank you for coming. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, as we are going to live show, we are going to discuss the uh, Muslim ban. We are going to talk about news about Donald Trump, America, and we are going to talk about the Muslim, America, and we are going to talk about the Muslim. So as we are going to talk about the show, we are going to talk Also, we are going to talk about the young Bible. We are going to talk about the view. And we are going to talk about the question. We are going to talk about the email address on the screen. We are going to talk about the email. Also, we are going to talk about the number. We are going to talk about the show. We are going to talk about the show. As always, this is a show all about the youth and we want to hear your views. We've got views in the studio, but we want to know what you at home think about what's going on. So the numbers on the screen, please get in touch. We've also got our uh, Facebook uh, details as well, as well as the email address. So please get involved. And if there are people out and about who can't watch this show at home, they can watch it live on Facebook. Okay, so uh, the format of today's show will be our audience asking questions and then our panel members uh, trying to answer it the best we can and uh, we'll see uh, what unfolds. Okay, um, I'm going to start off by asking Sarah. Sarah, if you could uh, ask your first question. Hi, okay, so uh, Trump's Muslim ban it affects seven Muslim majority countries, including that of Iran, Syria, and Iraq. However, it doesn't extend to that of Qatar or Saudi Arabia. Um, why do you think that is? And is the fact that um, Qatar Airlines, they hold um, offices in Trump's tower in Manhattan. Do you believe that has any um, incentive as to why Trump hasn't banned these countries? Okay, can I ask uh, Elaine to answer that? Um, yeah, I think it has a lot to do with it. So Trump is not a person that is you know, trying to build relations with other countries or anything. He has decided that he doesn't like particular countries. So he doesn't like Iran and he doesn't like um, Iraq and the other countries that he's banned. But where he's got business interests, exactly like Qatar, um, then they get a bit of a friendlier reception because uh, at the end of the day him becoming president has not been about doing anything for anyone other than himself so he has still got all of his business interests that he hasn't uh, moved away from he's got his like daughter in um, meetings with Chinese investors that she isn't meant to be in and that's all what this is about it's all about him and how he furthers his interests and um, it's not about doing anything to make the world a better place or anything like that it's purely I've got this business interest uh, I can make money from not banning these countries so I'm going to keep doing that um, and then he will carry on with his um, very despotic uh, anti-Muslim view of the world in other ways so I think it has a lot to do with it. Okay thank you. Um, Arib what is the feeling amongst journalists in the UK with everything that's happening uh, regarding the Muslim ban? Um, <laughs> I, th I think in terms from, from a UK perspective, it's more the fact that it's not happening to us at the minute because journalists in, in the US are having a pretty tough time. For example, t Donald Trump yesterday banned a number of key major outlets from its uh, press conference. It was rather an off-the-record press conference in the White House. And this is a very common thing whereby um, the White House invites journalists from all walks of life to be able to come in, ask questions, hold it to account. And it's kind of something that the Americans are very proud of in terms of its democracy. So for example, CNN, BuzzFeed, New York Times, some big, big names that have been covering American politics. They've, 
they, they were banned. And this, this is sending a really concerning kind of message to journalists, especially in terms of who will be allowed in, who won't be allowed in. In terms of from the UK perspective, I think it's having more of an effect on journalists who come from those seven countries or journalists who come from, who have an Iranian background, who have a Syrian background or um, journalists who are Muslims, for example, like myself. We're afraid of what will happen to us when we go to um, the uh, the United States. I know that in if you get entry, if you get entry. I mean, I was there actually during the election, and even I think it's something to bear in mind. Even prior to Trump's um, presidency, there were stri strict ba kind not bans, but strict regulations that were targeting Muslims disproportionately. Yeah. I know that I was, um, for example, targeted um, by um, by s airport security in America. I was questioned for an hour and a half. I was singled out, and I knew I was singled out because I had four S's on my ticket. So even from the London, I was already profiled from the very, very beginning. Sure. So uh, and also in terms of Trump's original executive order ban. Uh, um, that states the Muslim ban and what, it's, what it sets out, it did include journalists. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of journalists, it did send a lot of questions, especially for Iraqi journalists who have a strong American presence, whose politics have been shaped by America's presence in the country. Sure. OK. Thank you for that. Um, do our, any of our youths have anything they want to add? Because obviously we want to make it very interactive. Um, how do you... Does anyone have a view on what Arab said about certain nationals being targeted and being allowed to be part of that meeting, whereas um, others weren't? Okay, so do think about it, and uh, you know, if you do have a question, uh, let's make it as interactive as possible. Ibrahim, um, is there more to it than meets the eye? This Muslim ban. There is. I mean, for a very long time, there's been a huge securitization agenda. Uh, going on in the United States, and it's escalating in so many severe ways. I'll give you just one anecdotal example. There's a young man, happens to be from Wales, or Bengali origin, who's flying to the United States via Iceland or Reykjavik, and he was detained, he was not allowed to continue his connection to the United States. Now, a lot of people don't understand why that is. There are a number of countries that actually allow for the United States to have their border and their police officers in Iceland, Ireland, and Canada, which is more controversial because they're debating it right now in the Canadian par Parliament. And what that means is that you as a Canadian, you as an Icelandic citizen, you as an Irish citizen, can be detained by a US officer, can be questioned by a US officer, as if you're on US soil. So what, I what is happening is that this securitization agenda is not happening only within its borders, but even abroad. So the US is seeking these concessions from these countries to allow travel. Mm -hmm. And it throws into doubt the whole idea of freedom of movement, freedom of travel, but also this, the profile and discrimination that we see. So with the Muslim ban, for example, I mean, my suspicion would be is that these countries, that when the White House will argue saying, oh no, they haven't got the same security measure that we expect of other Muslim countries. But ultimately, it's, there's a monetary element to it. I mean, these Muslim countries, not all of them, but some of them are significantly poorer, you could say, than maybe the Gulf states. So there's an example of, for example, refugees in East Africa who had visas, legitimate visas, to be sent to, to go to the United States. They couldn't fly. Same for Iraqis, same for Syrians and so on. So obviously the man is interested in what is uh, in his interest financially and fiscally. Uh, so it doesn't really matter to him if you're a Muslim or in some, in some, in some senses. It could be that you're a poor Muslim, it doesn't really matter to him. Uh, but you're, if you're a rich Muslim, then fine, we've got a kind of deal with you, really. Sure, OK. Um, thank you. Now... If you're watching this at home and you're not familiar with the topic, then my question is, where have you been all this time? Okay. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to watch the very video that brought this uh, particular debate to uh, to our audiences worldwide. Uh, so we're going to watch a clip when Donald Trump, for the first time, um, made this uh, very uh, famous uh, speech regarding the Muslim ban. So can we have that on the screen, please? We put out a statement today. We watched this, and it's impossible to watch this gross incompetence that I watched last night. And we put out a statement a little while ago, and these people are going crazy. <laughs> they won't report it properly. Shall I read you the statement? Yeah. Donald J. Trump is calling for it. Now, listen, you got to listen to this one, because this is pretty, pretty heavy stuff, and it's common sense, and we have to do it. Remember the poll numbers. 25%, 51%. Remember the poll numbers. Okay, so remember this. So listen. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on.
We have no choice. We have no choice. We have no choice. According to Pew Research, among others, there is a great hatred toward Americans by large segments of the Muslim population. Most recently, a poll from Center for Security Policy released data showing 25% of those polled agreed that violence against Americans, these are people that are here, by the way, people here, 25, not 1%. By the way, 1% would be unacceptable. 1% is unacceptable. 25% of those polled agreed that violence against Americans here in the United States is justified as part, think of that, as part of the global jihad. They want to change your religion. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. Not going to happen. As part of the global jihad, and 51% of those polled agreed that Muslims in America should have the choice of being governed according to Sharia. You know what Sharia is? 51%. Sharia author authorizes, and I, look, this is, I mean, it's terrible. Sharia authorizes such atrocities as murder against non-believers who won't convert, beheadings, and more unthinkable acts that pose great harm to Americans, especially women. I mean, you look, especially women. Tough stuff. And we have a president that won't even mention the term. And you're talking about numbers like this. Mr. Trump stated, without looking at the various polling data, it's obvious to anybody the hatred is beyond comprehension of such a big portion. Where the hatred comes from and why, we will have to determine. We're going to have to figure it out. We have to figure it out. We can't live like this. It's going to get worse and worse. You're going to have more World Trade Centers. It's going to get worse and worse, folks. We can be politically correct and we can be stupid, but it's going to get worse and worse. Until we are able to determine and understand this problem and the dangerous threat it poses, our country cannot be the victim of horrendous attacks by people that believe only in jihad. These are people only believe in jihad. They don't want our system. They don't want our system. And have no sense of reason or respect for human life. They have no respect for human life. Okay, so um, that was a footage from uh, one of the speeches made by Donald Trump that uh, obviously uh, led to uh, the discussion that we're having today. And his uh, campaign was uh, very much focused on this and other, other uh, concerns that he had about America and how to move forward in his views. My question, next question to you, Elaine, is, you know, there's been a lot of stuff in the media about uh, celebrities uh, leading on protests, um, about things that they're, they're not in agreement about Trump. There's also been, um, you know, to the point where even on Facebook, there have been, uh, I think there was an article in one of the major newspapers that you, you've you got p uh, people who are into witchcraft who are trying to put spells onto Donald Trump yeah. to try and, um, try and obviously stop him from doing what he's doing. And you've also had people at uh, airports uh, accommodating Muslims in prayer, you know, uh, celebrating all of that. Could one argue that despite everything we've said so far, that Donald Trump's decision to ban Muslims um, is in fact further is uniting people as opposed to dividing them? I think it's uniting people that didn't vote for him anyway. So it's not changing anyone's minds. I don't think you're, uh, you're getting people that voted for him going, oh, hang on a minute, this isn't what I thought he was going to do. The people that voted for him are very much feeling 
brilliant, this is exactly what I wanted, um, this is the kind of change that I want in the country, he speaks up for me and whatever else. Um, and the people that are coming together against it are the people that wouldn't have voted for Donald Trump anyway. So it's great that people are doing things, but it's not changing the minds of those people that supported Donald during the election, unfortunately. Um, and that's only going to come from challenging the things that he says and his preconceptions. Like in that video where he's talking about, you know, do you know what Sharia law is? I'm pretty sure he doesn't. Um, and so for him to be getting up there making speeches and um, pushing this perception about um, what Islam is and who Muslims are as a community, like that's the bit that we have to tackle, I think. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so once again, um, this is a live show that's been broadcasted on Facebook as well. If you've got any questions, please do get involved. The number's on the screen, as is the email. Next question comes from Nida. Okay, can we have the mic to Nida, please? So, um, do you think the Muslim ban will um, add fuel to the already rising um, Islamophobia? And if so, how should we combat this sentiment? Okay. Uh, can I ask Ibrahim to answer that? Uh, to answer your question directly, I mean, yes, I do think it is. I mean, I think it's got to a stage now where words always did matter. And I think the, the leader of the free world, a person like Donald Trump, says things. I mean, it emboldens and gives confidence to racists and to fascists and to bigots all around the world. Obviously, in the United States, an example of that. So obviously, you know, words matter, you know, and, and, I, and I would argue that when attacks happen, mosques are built, women are attacked on streets, the men are attacked on streets, children and all the rest of it because of their, because they either look Muslim or Muslim have been racialized. So even we see attacks on Sikh community, for example, they're not Muslims, but they've been racialized to say, well, they look different. They don't, they don't look like, a, like a, a typical wasp, which is like a, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant who's typically American. Uh, you know, we should attack them. So. Obviously, it has, and the words you know don't exist in a vacuum. So obviously, he has responsibility to act as you know to act responsibly, and ultimately, everything that he does say, and I would argue, that every harmful effect that does happen is purely uh, squarely at his foot. I mean, it's his fault. I mean, and obviously, what needs to happen, I think, the way forward. There needs to be a very strong and assertive movement, and I think you're seeing the you've seen it already in the states, also in the UK. It's really sort of endearing to see, you know, where you have all kinds of people from all different backgrounds coming together, a strong anti-fascist, anti-racist uh, campaign that says no to this sort of intolerance, no to this kind of racial hatred and prejudice. But ultimately, as well, I think from I would argue maybe a Muslim perspective, or to see that this has been something that's been coming down the line for a very long time. And, I, and this might sound a bit bizarre, but I think for a long time we've always had this idea, well, okay, well, this particular person is not so bad. They don't necessarily call for violence and hatred. But ultimately, when you start to justify things uh, in the interest of security, then there's always that justification. So I'll give you one example. I mean, people, you know, give eulogies about Obama. Not to, not to compare Obama to Trump, obviously. But obviously, Obama had a huge opportunity while he was there to set a lot of things right. And I would argue that had Donald Trump, uh, you know, had Donald Trump come in and Obama had done that, he wouldn't be able to do it. So an issue of torture, for example. I mean, Donald Trump has called for the torture of the families, by the way, of terror suspects. Not even the terror suspects, the families. And had Obama, I would argue, prosecuted and taken those people to court, were involved in extraordinary torture. You're waterboarding a man 329 times. You know, a person not been given a trial or any or any or any charge whatsoever allows that normalization. Well, they did it. You know, no one got prosecuted. They got away. The next guy who comes in is far worse. Obviously, not to again compare this to two, but obviously, there's clearly a lack of accountability. So ultimately, it's about holding these people to account uh, as well. So you know, there's a huge responsibility on. I would argue the American people, but also I think people here as well and people in other countries will be looking very carefully and saying, well, it happened very quickly over there, you know, and we're seeing this rise of fascism, you know, in Hungary, the French elections are coming up, the Dutch elections are coming up, there are people in the Swedish and Danish parliaments, these are liberal countries, you no one would have thought you had far right people in these governments, in these parliaments, but that's steadily happening. So people need to be aware of that, that Ultimately, if you don't challenge these issues very early on, they do keep, keep up on you very quick, quick, uh, quickly. Thank you. Nida, um, what's your opinion on the question? Do you feel it's on the rise? Definitely. I, I think by, by virtue of the Muslim ban and this idea of radical Islam, you're giving space to radicalism and you know, radicalism being part of Islam and terrorism being part of Islam. Islam is not about that, and so I think Islamophobia is definitely on the rise after this. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Can we uh, can we have a next question from Tiba, please? 
Yeah, so I think you already touched upon it, but um, the question was, why do you think that this mass mobilization of people, you know, protesting against institutionalized Islamophobia, why has that, that not been carried out in the past, for example? So obviously, as Muslims, the Muslim community would argue that they witnessed Islamophobia from, um, I guess, you know, the po immediate post 9-11 era, uh, for the past decade, um, so yeah, why would you say just now that people are mobilizing across not only the US but the UK as well? Before we ask one of our panel members, why, what's, your, uh, what's your take on that? Um, so I, I completely agree with what you were saying. I think um, Islamophobia has manifested itself in different forms. Um, so for example, obviously post 9-11 you had a massive spike in Islamophobic attacks against Muslims and Sikhs, also people that were racialized, people that um, people kind of grouped together as being Muslim, even though they may not have necessarily been Muslim in faith. Um, but I think it was a lot more subtle, and it was a lot more, um, they used the rhetoric of freedom of speech, they used, um, they went through maybe, um, you know, a lot more, they weren't as outspoken, I guess you could say, as Donald Trump. So Donald Trump is basically the mouthpiece, I think, for people that have been harboring these Islamophobic views, but they haven't necessarily been saying it. And now he's coming to power, I think that's, um, legitimised a lot of people's um, discriminatory views. Okay, thank you. Um, we will come back and ask our panel members to answer that, but we've come to the end of the first segment. So, um, you know, do stay uh, tuned in for the next two segments. And, you know, like we said at the start, uh, this is we're just starting the debate here and uh, trying to understand and unfold uh, some of the concerns that we have uh, in the UK, uh, much more closer to home with what's happening uh, in America and also, you know, the impact it's having locally, nationally and globally. So please do email us uh, and do phone in. We will be taking phone calls from the next segment onwards. And uh, please do uh, spread the word so others can also tune in and share their views. So uh, we hope to see you very soon.